Hello. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you a lot. So I am Paula Campora. I am a developer and rigger. And here we have Ivan Capiello. He is director and 3D artist. And Lucio, he is a pure coder. And together we do animation. And we've been doing this for a couple of years now. It's more like 10 years. And because of this, we we rig a lot <laughs> because because when you want to move something in animation, you you have to rig it. So <laughs> if you want to start to establish the meaning of rig, which is pronounced rig, and <laughs> <laughs> we went very technical on this because in the end <laughs> that's the best definition I could make. Um, what do we do in production? Why do we rig? Because we do not want to move the models directly, because the model might, might change during the course of the production. So we want to model something else. It, it is a placeholder, or maybe it is a, an interface to the model, because you move a controller, the controller moves the model, and then you can carry on, finalize the model, you change it, you've got many versions, usually or one model, so you don't want to touch it. You want to be able to change the model during the production, and usually you have more than just one rig because you have many characters, props, a lot of stuff that is going on in a film. And what you have to expect from a rig, especially if we are talking on one production, is consistency because you only want to learn how to use it once. And you want to keep your animations once you update your rig because you don't want to lose your work. And you want to share the animations between similar characters or similar props because you don't want to do more work. Um, rigging is a twofold process. I think that there must be riggers here, so most of you know already. But when you rig, what's going on is that the computer or maybe the technical animator what he will see is a mesh, so list of points, and a deformer, so some rules that can move the mesh, and drivers, constraints, it's still rules, algorithms, and the math stuff. And what the animator sees instead is, is a character. It's a character with controls, he can make stuff, it's something that allows him to work. And why the deformation system is unique? To an animator, there must be, there are possibly there must be more ways to achieve one result, more systems, more chains, because we want to use uh, inverse kinematics sometimes, or sometimes we want to move the controls directly. But who makes the rig? It's usually down to riggers. The riggers are 3D artists. They have to know how to model at least a, a bit. And they have to know how to deform a model. So what tools do you have that can change the shape of a mesh? And they have to know a bit of math. Not too much. You don't have to be a wizard of math. But you have to know the basics. It's usually the high school math will do. And then we use tools. We use some automatic procedures that helps it helps doing our job, especially when it is serialized, when you have a lot of assets to rig, you want some help from the computer. So the, the, the job of a rigger is, somebody says, just putting bones into it. So we build a hierarchy, hierarchy of transformations, the skeleton, and we set up the constraints. It's more rules about how this skeleton should move. We add custom properties because sometimes you can, you need more uh, specific controllers, and we build the controls because this way the animator can access to them. But what does the auto rig do? It is pretty much the same. I would say it is down to the machine sticking over if it is, <laughs> it is going this way. But the thing is, this is not the truth because. The job of a rigger, it, it is different. It's not about putting bones in a model or in a mesh. It, it is about planning how this asset will be used. 
So which kind of interaction would be necessary? And this is, this may, might mean, what will the animator see, but also something more technical. For instance, what will the character do? It might, be, it might seem strange, but sometimes you have a character that will do most of his screening time with the hands up, maybe because he <laughs> he's kept hostage or he's just bringing a tray or something. In that case, you will need different rotation order in order to avoid gimbal lock. So all the stuff you had to plan in advance, and this is the job of a rigger to do. Um, we also plan which kind of deformation have to achieve, because sometimes the character has to drink, so you want his neck to move accordingly. Sometimes he's shirtless, so you have to pay particular attention about the torso and muscles and this kind of stuff. And the autorig does all of the rest. So all of the complex and especially the mechanical stuff, it's down to the, to the machine to do. So actually the autorig assists the rigger. It doesn't steal yet. <laughs> so how did it begin? When we started doing animation, we started doing pretty much what everybody else was doing because we were not expert enough to do it our way. So we were using commercial software and commercial rigs. We, we had just built it. But what was our job then? We still did stuff. We had to set up the rotation orders. And we had to set up the accessories, like some characters, they had glasses or hats. Those had to be rigged. And we also rigged hair and clothes, but with dynamic rigs for simulations, but also stuff that could be moved manually. And then I just thought it would have been cool to work on movies, so I flew to London and joined MPC. And it was nice, I worked on this, but on many movies that year. It, it has been a, quite a nice year. And yeah, it's The Jungle Book, Fantastic Four, Spectre, and Batman vs. Superman. It was my first time in a very big pipeline, so I moved from a very small studio where we did everything. Well, everything we were not buying, but everybody was doing everything. I was a generalist, and then I went to work as a rigger on these films, and I confronted that huge pipeline. So the thing is, now it was not no more commercial rigs. Those were proprietary rigs, and they were full-featured character. There wasn't much I had to do because everything was just done for in previous shows. And we had a heavy focus on the anatomy because to achieve believable results, believable characters, digi doubles, and stuff like this, you need to make all of the joints in the anatomically correct spots to allow the technical animator to pick up the, the work and make believable simulations of muscles. And we had separate rigs for animation and render. And this is kind of nice because it relates to the previous slide about the twofold process. This time, I was really rigging for the animator and for the computer or the canim. Because usually, before going to the render, the tech canim department, they extracted all of the animation and they used physical simulation to make it more real. I cannot go any deeper because I signed an NDA and they have lawyers, so let's stop it here. <laughs> but the thing is, it was very fun. And one nice thing is, for this show, for these guys, I used Blender. So it was not a production software because it was my own decision to use it for some stuff. What I did with Blender, I had to model some proxy for the animation rig. I rigged Wonder Woman, and I had some time left. So I thought it would have been nice for the animator to have a low-res model for previous, and I just did it. I opened Blender. We had Linux workstations, so Blender was part of the distribution, and just did it. And the animators liked it a lot, so they asked me if I could do this for Batfleck and for Superman, please. And I did. Uh, it was nice because that day 
I actually was, I was modeling, so technically I was a modeler for one day. But the thing is, I was modeling to create the interface that would have been used for the animation, so to me, I was rigging. And here we go, because the year later, I came back to make animation at this time. This time we were expert, or maybe old, and we just wanted to do as we wished. So we switched to open source software. We used Blender, and luckily there was a, a rigging tool already in Blender. It is Rigify. And we switched from customizing commercial tools to contribute to an existing tool, which is better. It is a more inclusive way to work. Um, we, we loved it from day one. Um, what we did was mainly to clean up the code of Rigify, which was a production script. In production, you, you just care for it to work. It just has to work. It, it doesn't have to be beautiful. Um, we make it a bit prettier in the sy syntax, the programming stuff, so it's not something you could really see for mostly, but the thing is we, we just did it. And we took over as maintainer of this module because at the time it was orphaned, so we, we just took it. Um, so about Rigify, because it is a tool with history, it has been developed by Nathan McDowell, the legend of Blender rigging, and Campbell Barton, he is a Blender developer. They developed it to make the animated, the open movies, the Blender Institute. And it was working already, it was nice, it has been released, shipped with Blender. And a couple of years later, an Israeli studio, Pichipoi, they needed some more features. They needed different kind of limbs and a face rig. They added it and they created a new version of Rigify with more features. So the thing is, we took Pichipoi Rigify because we needed those features, but it came with a problem. The problem is, it was a fork. So when you take a, a project and you change it, and you change it maybe too hardly or too fast for those changes to go back to, to the master project, then you have created a fork. And the fork might be problematic because there are risks when using forks. And what is the risk when you plug a fork in? <laughs> so the risks are, well, to begin with, it was not shipped with Blender, so you buy a wonderful new workstation, you want to work already, but you have to install the fork rather than the original script, and then it is not guaranteed that it will keep working once you update your Blender version. It kept working for the most part. We had to make some small changes, but the thing is, nobody is due to make it work. So there were problem, and another problem that comes when using forks is the the the, the devlog. A developer doesn't know what to do with a fork or a user as well because you need a feature. Okay, I, I'm adding it to master, and then it's yeah cool, but I was using the other one. Okay, I'll, then we add it to the other one, but now we are even farther away from seeing the time when it will be back to the mother project. And it is the same with the fix. Um, we need both, we need features, we need fix. So in 2017, under the direction of Ivan Capiello and the work of Lucio Rossi, finally, the two projects have been merged into one tool. So that was my part. The introduction is over. I now leave everything. We'll come back for the people. conclusions. OK. OK. Thank you. Uh, i give you a brief explanation on how Rigify works, because uh, I have a lot of requests of uh, people saying uh, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working, and instead they're just not reading the wiki. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the easiest access to read the wiki is uh, just near the report bug. <laughs> The other one, please. So please, first click on the left, then on the right, if the answer is not there. So uh, Rigify works in uh, three 
basic ways. Uh, first, I would like to have a big applause for Nathan and uh, Campbell. They did this on the first uh, uh, alone, so please. We took cover from them, and, and uh, this is a basic explanation of what he does, and uh, it's not from us. Uh, uh, the basic method is uh, based on, uh, you had a, a basic meta rig, there is a simplified version of the rig, uh, the, the software used to create all the controls, and we added uh, some new meta rigs there. But you can start from uh, uh, choosing the, the, ne the nearest one to your model, then you follow the wiki, and you see how, where you can place landmarks, where the bones should be placed. It's very detailed, so you can uh, check, at least for human, and have an overview on, uh, on how it should work. And then you click Generate button, and it's done. Uh, at least all the controls are created. You have just to make an automatic binding uh, for the character. It should work uh, if you have placed correctly the bone and there are enough bones to deform the character, it should work uh, right out of the box. Then we have the advanced mode. That is built uh, uh, in, in a different way. We just have to create a single bone because we need the armature object to work with. Then you delete in edit mode everything that's there. And then you can just add some samples from the list. You choose uh, uh, the right one for you, maybe the leg, the, the paw. There are lots of them pre-installed. You then can uh, have this kind of uh, set where uh, every sample is together and you place it in the correct position and uh, just parent all the samples together to the correct parent. And then you have to take care of the layers. The bone are, uh, has to be split on layers. Uh, and uh, also the rig UI, the, the ramp, the rig UI will be uh, used uh, for creating uh, on the final rig uh, bone groups and uh, selection sets and bone colors and moreover uh, lots of things you can do from here. Uh, this is uh, not so detailed in the wiki so my plan is to update the wiki in the, free, in the spare time of next year to have it complete and then you have uh, the option to generate the gig again. Last thing is uh, uh, the pro. Uh, uh, we wanted to keep the, this tool open to pro users. So uh, how do you use it if you are a pro? Uh, this is in two parts. My part is uh, showing you in the UI how it is designed to work. And then I leave the word to Lucio that uh, will explain which is the work under the hood to make this uh, happen. So um, you again add the, the, the armature object, you delete everything, and then you can build from scratch if you know what you're doing. Uh, uh, the, the spine in this example, then you select the first bone of the chain because this is a modular rig system, you have uh, split parts that have to be assembled together and you add this property, then uh, you know that this is a spine, the software knows this is a spine and uh, you can customize it in this panel, there is a specific panel for each type, uh, here I, I have defined where the tail starts, where the spine ends, where the neck is and where the, where the head is through a panel similar to this. Then you have again to take care by yourself of this, this is in automatic in the basic version. Uh, and uh, then you can have access to the generate advanced options that now lets you upgrade more than one rig per scene. You can specifically select which rig you want to update if you have more than one. And you can also create a new one uh, with a, a different name. And the uh, uh, bonus is that the rig UI will be accordingly named for, uh, for the character and the link to the character. So when you link the character in another scene, the rig UI will be merged in that file without having you to manually load it. So I leave the word to Lucio and I ask you another big applause because it's his birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, now for the really boring part, which is <laughs> uh, what you have to do when you want to interact with the code of Rigify. Uh, so when you want to define custom uh, uh, rig types uh, and uh, meta rigs and stuff. Uh, 
please do it without forking. Uh, don't fork around. I mean, it's <laughs> it's really uh, it can be really painful for the people that will come after me after my work. Okay, uh, please. <laughs> okay, when you want to add uh, a new rig type uh, module, well, you may be think that maybe there's a base class. Okay, there's no base class for the rig, so uh, I have to explain you <laughs> what uh, the interface of the rig class should be. Uh, actually, um, okay, you have a constructor in which you have to pass uh, the uh, a variable which is called obj, which is the uh, armature object. Then you have to pass uh, the name of the first bone of the chain, so it's the base bone of the chain. Then you will pass parameters that are the parameters that the user will define inside the interface. Then you uh, must have uh, inside the rig class a generate function, which is uh, called uh, um, by a main generate module when you hit the generate button um, practically. So, and this generate function is basically <coughs> a series of callbacks one after the other. And all these uh, other functions which you define, and there is no a real, uh, I mean, uh, rule on up to now on uh, how you have to write these functions uh, will create all the bones that uh, work underneath uh, your rig type. So you will create the mechanical bones, the deaf, the deaf bones, etc. Uh, each callback should extend uh, like a dictionary of the names of the bones going along uh, and add more uh, to that uh, on the way. Uh, uh, the final thing that the generate function has to do is has to return to the caller a, um, a snippet uh, uh, that is a list uh, of uh, snippets actually, uh, so of strings uh, that have to be up, um, appended to this uh, rig UI template file and together the rig UI template and these snippets they create what is called the file the, uh, that is very important for rigify which is the rig UI file. Uh, the rig UI file is what uh, um, gives us the possibility of uh, uh, having the rig work even without uh, the add-on installed. And these snippets that uh, the, the function has to return, since they usually uh, depend on the names of the bones that uh, the user is defining, uh, are of course usually some format strings that have to be filled up by the generate function before uh, it returns. Uh, then you have to add some other functions inside uh, the class, and uh, these are also mandatory and they are very important. The add parameters that define at uh, runtime, all the, the remaining parameters uh, of the rig type that you are introducing inside uh, the, um, the Blender BPY. Uh, then you have to uh, define a parameters UI, which is just a layout of what the user is going to uh, look at when he wants to uh, define the parameters of the, of the rig type. And then a create sample function, which automates the creation of a sample which should be granted to work uh, in the generation for that particular rig type. Uh, this method should be defined, we will define this method as static methods. Uh, sometimes uh, when I do programming in Python, I think uh, how Java is beautiful for <laughs> this kind of things and uh, interfaces and stuff. So basically the interface of the class is something like this in the end. So you have uh, a rig uh, defined class with uh, its constructor and the generate function. Then you can do basically whatever you want, but it's better that you follow the advices that I gave you. And then these three functions which are very important. Um, okay to um, generate uh, the create sample function, which is very important because it uh, saves you a lot of time to define uh, all the bones that belong, belong to uh, your rig type, there is an automation that was uh, already developed b before, before me and uh, uh, gives you the possibility of encode directly the structure that you just made and in which you define all the properties into a snippet of code uh, which is a create sample that you will find in the, in the, in the text editor in a file called matter example. You just have to copy paste this function and put it inside the, the rig definition. 
Uh, also, you can do something similar for the metering. So after you build the metering, as uh, Ivan showed you, uh, you just press encode metering and it will create a file which is already prepared for defining all the sub uh, rigs, so all the rig types that made up a complete metering. So uh, you will have only to take this file, rename it as you wish, and put it inside the directory of uh, rigs, metarig, and and the group uh, of uh, metrics that you want to that you want to use, like animals, for example, something like that. Uh, also, you can define some custom widgets in the same way. Uh, you first uh, you construct a mesh, and then you hit this encode mesh widget. So you will have a function that creates a widget. You will always find uh, um, this uh, this function inside the file, which is called widget uh, widgets.py, and it's inside the text editor again. And uh, you just have to copy paste this create thing widget, and you will rename it to whatever you wish, and put it somewhere inside. The code. Where is better to put it inside the Rigify Rigs widgets file? <laughs> and uh, but uh, okay, if you don't find this button, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a regression on the last uh, commit that I made on uh, uh, on Blender. Uh, okay, th these are uh, the basic, I mean, steps that you have to follow uh, actually to do to have the same effect of pressing the button. Okay. The next milestone, okay, we will keep on maintaining the code, we will keep on uh, expanding it and uh, getting it better, but it needs it badly needs some uh, refactoring and some uh, recoding. Uh, first of all, okay, we need a base class for the ring, <laughs> and uh, this is very important. And uh, because it defines uh, a way to interact with the code, which is more, uh, you know, again, it makes more sense. Uh, and also, uh, you can uh, you can get compliance for free one once you follow the instruction of the base class. You uh, your the, your job is basically easier. Uh, and also, we were discussing with, with Nathan also the possibility of uh, um, letting other people to expand it in a more, uh, you know, in an easier way. Uh, so probably uh, in the add-on interface, we will uh, uh, give the possibility of defining a, a directory where you want to take um, your metrics from, and um, okay, and add the models as you wish. Uh, so, okay, th that was basically it. I will leave it to Paolo for right, the wrap-up. Let's see up. everybody here, <laughs> the three of us, okay. because in the end, well, you keep this, <laughs> it's the same. So the thing is, this presentation name, the title is The Power of Rig, and the reason is we needed a catchy title. We were running out of time, it was last day submission, and I was drunk, and so... <laughs> So I just put this title up there. But the thing is, there is some truth in it because rigging is a task that, as you could see, or you probably knew already, it requires a diversity of skills. So it's either one very eclectic people, or it is many people with a variety of skills, or many eclectic people. But in the end, we are talking about everything. We are talking about sculpture, we are talking about math, and we are talking about pipelines. So it is um, um, in the middle of an animation pipeline. So what happens is it brought us together. We had to, to join forces in order to have our char characters to finally move. And express emotions. Um, there is an aesthetic pressure. So it is true that rigging is hidden. In the end, you don't really see it. And outside these kind of events, when you say, yeah, I work as a rigger, oh, but so the thing is, you don't see it, but you see the results. So in the end, we all can agree about whether the formation is good or not, because I might be a mathematician and I can see that something is wrong, or Ivan can be a sculptor, he will see if it works or not. Um, on a personal level too, it will maybe expand your skill base because, for instance, I learned to draw, to draw because I had to even learn some coding and Lucio, he learned computer graphics and this is what happens when you mess with bricks. So the thing is, <laughs> the power of rig brought us together and now it's yours. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.